from kind of how I normally do it. I'm going to kind of give you a synopsis this morning because some people tend to want to leave early and I want to get to the punchline, so to speak. So I'm going to just go through and explain, give you a few examples of how we integrate livestock in our operation. Then I'm going to give you some uh, financial data on profitability of this type of assistance. So this shows a part of our operation. It's not the whole operation, but it's a part of it. Down here on the bottom, I don't know where the clicker is on this. There we are. This, this is my home unit. So that's my, my farmstead there. The blue highlighted areas are cropland. The light green areas are the tame grass pasture. So that was cropped at one time, and now it's seeded back into perennial pastures. And then the yellow areas are our uh, perennial pasture that that is a permanent pasture has never been been tilled. Now we do have some other land that's not on this map, but this gives you an idea. So when I plan out these rotations and this integration, how we marry the cropping and, and the grazing systems together. This is a close-up of, of our home unit just to show you. And we have native range up top, it's native range, and then over here this is all tame grass, uh, grass legume combinations, and this is cropland. So we're going to try and utilize all of this for different stages of the cattle and, a, and to better the whole system because we're going to use the cropland to give the rangeland pasture land a rest because that's the key to healthy rangeland, and I'll get into that a bit more this afternoon is rest and recovery. So we're going to use the cropland to fill those production and nutritional quality gaps, the nutritional quality gaps for the livestock. So one of the first things I recommend you do, and I just put a simple forage chart together here. So you take your operation and you chart, for instance, your cool season native grasses. When are they at their peak? Nutrient wise. When are they at their peak? When can you lot your livestock utilize them? Then warm seasons, and we go down through some of the uh, cool season introduced species like smooth brome and the alfalfa. And then we get down into the cover crops and some of those things. And, and we build it so we can try and graze the entire year. Now, because of uh, uh, where we're located in city jurisdiction and all the housing developments, we're not contiguous. Uh, we haven't been able to make it the whole year without grazing, uh, without feeding some hay but we're getting, we're getting close. So I strongly suggest you put a simple chart like this together for your operation and use it. Now, how many of you use a refractometer, measure bricks? Good, there's several in here. Uh, I'll just explain this briefly. In the upper right, that's a refractometer. Refractometer measures percent solids in liquid. And the lower right, that's a garlic press. That's what you use to squeeze the sap or the juice out of the plant. And then the lower left here, that's the scale that bricks is measured from 0 to 30. It's a good indicator of the nutrient density of a particular plant or forage. And we actually use this. We have one of these in our house. And we use it uh, whenever we go to purchase any type of fruits or vegetables. We will test the bricks because you want to eat nutrient-dense food. And so this is applicable not only to livestock, but to... Uh, uh, not only to forage for livestock, but for human consumption also. If you have high bricks measurement, you're going to have a plant that has high mineral absorption. And it's going to have an enhanced aroma, it'll have a longer shelf life. It'll also be a plant that's more resistant to disease and pest pressure. And we're seeing this. There's no magic number, but generally speaking, when you get 10 to 12 bricks and higher, it's pretty seldom that plant is going to be succumb to either disease or pest pressure. So as we build healthy soil, we're able to increase our bricks. Then we have healthier plants. We no longer have the disease and pest problems with them. OK, you'll also see in higher bricks plants a much wider leaf. You'll just notice that the plants are healthier. So when we're putting up forage, we'll actually go out and do a bricks reading before we put the forage up. And generally speaking, your bricks will rise during the day as that plant is collecting more sunlight through photosynthesis. It has the highest energy 
little later in the day. So we we never start, uh, we never cut hay in the morning. It's always from mid-afternoon on, and we use bricks to determine when to cut the hay, because we want that hay to have the highest nutritional density that it can. We also, this photo here depicts, that's all housing developments around to the north. What I've been doing the last 10 years is, as the city of Bismarck expands, the city of Bismarck is the fastest growing metropolitan city in the country between 50,000 and 100,000 people. So I know these acres close to town are going to go to housing. I'll rent them and export as many nutrients, those nutrients as I can onto my land, rather than put up hay on my own land. Knowing that sooner or later the landlord's going to uh, sell it for development, but if I, can, if I can hay it for three or five years or more, why not do that? So, some of the forages we use, I mentioned the tame grass legume pastures. For instance, alfalfa smooth grown, that's a combination we have. And I usually, I'm just listing a couple of the major components of those paddocks. I don't like grazing paddocks with only two species in them. And you can see there's several other species in that mix. We can easily get gains of over two and a quarter pounds a day, and our bricks level is 22 high or higher you know, at, at the peak time of the year. Now, it's not always going to be like that. Right away in the spring when it's lush and growing, bricks will be a little lower, and then they'll tend to get higher as those plants get a little uh, a little further along in development. And we will go in typically with, with stockers or grass finishers, and we will use uh, fairly high stock densities on, on these pastures. Uh, usually around 500,000 to 750,000 pounds of animal live weight per acre. That's pretty common on our operation. Not with cow-calf pairs, but with stockers. I'll talk about grass finishers in a bit. And we really like to just eat one-third, leave two-thirds, because in a biologically active soil, you need to leave that armor that we preached about yesterday. So eat one-third, leave two-thirds. Here's another paddock. This is a very diverse legume. There's about five different kinds of legumes in there. And I should explain what I actually did. I'll go back to a few photos here. On this paddock, this land out west, this was all west of my place. This was all crop when I first bought the place. And I wanted some tame grass pastures. And NRCI recommended, well, see, smooth grown grass, intermediate, and best in wheat grass. So we did that. Got a beautiful catch. <laughs> Terrible, terribly unhealthy standing grass. Though. Because that land had been tilled and cropped for so many years, I had no infiltration, I had no nutrient cycling, so I had a poor standing grass. Now, I wish I would have known then what I know now. Now when we go to seed land back to perennials, we jumpstart, so to speak, the soil health on that. We'll see that at least two years of very diverse cover crop mixes on that crop land. Graze it off with livestock to convert that to dollars, but we're priming the soil. We're accelerating biological time, because we'll use 25 different species each year to get as much different biology going in that soil as we can. We have all those dying, decaying roots. We jumpstart infiltration. So I hadn't done that here. So then what I did, you know, it was just poorly, poor production, and after about four years, I said, this just isn't working. I went to my extension agent, what can I do? He said, well, fertilize it. I said, no, that ain't going to happen. So I went on my own and I seeded a different legume in every one of these. I researched what I could, what legumes would work in my area. No one had really done much of that, so I, I went and I just started buying seed. I went out there with my no-till drill and seeded a different legume in each one. Now that I know which legumes work in our area, now whenever I seed, I use those species and I seed very diverse mixes, you know, so I don't put just one legume in each uh, paddock. And I would never see a cool season invasive like smooth chrome again. You know, it'll be something that was native to our area. But I've got it there, I work with it, so now in there there's sites from alfalfa, there's spreader tree alfalfa, there's common alfalfa, there's bird's foot tree foil, there's clover in there. It's a very diverse mix. And we can get pretty good gains on it, uh, also pretty good uh, uh, bricks levels in that mix. Now, the easiest way for anyone to get started in integrating livestock into crop land is with these fall seeded biennials. They just, usually there's a window of time in the fall where we can seed them 
and get them started. Now, I'm not talking about seeding this into perennial grass. It's difficult to get cover crops started in perennial grasses. So experiment with that as you, as you want. I'm talking about seeding these on cropland. This photo was actually taken on October 8th of this <laughs> past year. We were really dry, and I had seeded this a bit earlier, but we finally got a shower there for the first week in October, and it germinated. So that, that's winter triticale, hairy veg, coming up through a cover crop residue. We had grazed that cover crop uh, the month before, high stock density with a bunch of grass finishers. And that shows that triticale veg coming up through that. Here's another mix. We, we've used forage winter wheat, winter pea, hairy vetch, and radish. Now, we have not had great luck with the winter pea in our area, getting it over winter. So, I put it in the mix here. It germinated to come up, but we just haven't had great luck getting it over winter. Hairy vetch has never winter killed for me. We've been seeding it well over 20 years, and I've never lost it. This forage winter wheat, uh, we've seeded that now two years. Cattle seeds are really like it today. They relish the taste of it a lot better than rye or triticale, which makes sense. Now the radish comment. Um, we put radishes into these mixes, even though they're going to winter kill. They're only going to get a few inches tall, but that tapper will still go down several feet. Steve Graff with Cover Crop Solutions has done some studies that show if you add radish to a winter wheat crop or a fall seeded biennial about a five to seven bushel increase in yield even though you're, it's going to terminate over winter it scavenges enough nitrogen releases it in the spring they're getting a yield bump so we put it in there for the reason of cycling nutrients and to uh, let release those the next year also help some with infiltration obviously Brick cycles on our winter cereals are not quite as hot, uh, uh, 16, but we can still get good gains off of it. Here's winter triticale, hairy batch, about the same thing, you know, as far as, as far as nutrient density. Now, we can graze these in a multitude of ways, you know, we can graze them with stockers, we can graze them with calves, and I'm going to show you all the different combinations here we have for a fall seeded biennial. Okay, that's one. We can graze them early to get gain on livestock. Here's another one, but we only use this in an emergency, wool hay. I know that, that window there doesn't look like it was an emergency situation, but, but that's actually seeded. There's no synthetic fertility on that at all, and, and no herbicide whatsoever. That was seeded into a alfalfa hayland field that was getting old, that stand, we went in there in the fall and seeded directly into that. And that's what we got. Remember the photos I showed yesterday of that plot work where the radishes and turnips were dried up and then the multi-species was, was uh, thriving, triple the biomass? This field here is exactly one mile north of that. And this is the same year. I'll tell you a story about this. I seeded this in the fall. It laid for three weeks. We caught a half inch of rain on it and it germinated. Very open during the winter, as I said, not a lot of snow. It did have some snow, so there was some moisture there. Then that same inch that that clock got, I got on that field. So that crop there was from an inch and a half of rain plus some snowfall. Now I'll tell you a true story about that. Right after this picture was taken, one night I had a phone call. And the guy on the other hand said, hey, is that your, he didn't know my name, he just asked, is that your hay there on the north side of the interstate? And I thought he was going to ask, how did you get it, you know? How did you get that many bales in the drought? Instead, he said to me, you need to get those bales out there, because if you don't, we're not going to get disaster insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I just hung up. I, I hung up the phone. I thought, if you're going to wait by the mailbox for a check, rather than learn how to do practices such as this, I have no time for it. But that's a true story. So it's kind of ironic I happened to take that picture the same time that plot work was going on down there, and that shows what can be done in a very dry climate, very dry year. So that's another option. Here's another option. You can let the fall biennials go and combine. And, and I tell you, I have made some good money selling uh, seed from these fall biennials. You know, so it's options. Every year we try to put 
two to four hundred acres in these fall biannuals because they leave me so many options of what I can do with it. Here's another option, and we really like this one. We like calving out of them. Works extremely well for us. We used to calve in the middle of winter, now we start calving May 15th. We calve from May 15th to late June. Turn that, you know, the cows, uh, we weed typically are last week in March, around April 1st. Turn those cows out, this winter trade it clearly starts greening up late April and that, and they just blow up like ticks. You know, they get fatter than a pig on it. And we're moving them every few days. They get turned on to, on to a fresh allotment. We're not, when we're calving, we're not using high stock density because we want them to be able to go off a little ways and have their calf. We don't set up a back fence when we're grazing this, you know. We'll let them go back, get their calves, and then we'll, we'll move a back fence further back, you know, so they have several days allotment at a time. Calves on here are extremely healthy. You know, we, we check our cows once a day simply to, uh, simply to tag and band them. And the only reason we're tagging them, we don't have our cattle yet where we want them for our operation, so we want to know um, uh, who the, the dams are. I can honestly say this, we've been doing this now about going on seven years. In that time frame, we have 350 head a year. I have not seen a cat born in seven years. My son has seen one. We've lost one cat. We have the heifers right up with the cows. Absolutely not an issue. Do we lose calves? Sure, we lose a few. But we lose a lot less now than we used to lose scabbing in the corral in the winter. It's absolutely amazing to us. It just simply works. Now I'm going to preface the next picture a little bit. My son in college, a lot of his buddies, you know, they're talking about things, and most of his friends are calving there during the middle of winter. And back here, four and five years ago, we had a couple of years in a row, 120 plus inches of snow, pretty rough winters, and they were they were calling them saying, man, this, this sucks. We're losing calves, scouring calves, frozen calves, mud. Paul said, well, I feel for you. I'll send you a picture when I'm calving. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's kind of how calving goes on our operation. And, and it really is that enjoyable. The first year we made the switch, I told my wife, I feel guilty. I should have to pay somebody to enjoy calving this month. Because it just doesn't feel right after after uh, 26 years of cabin in the middle of winter, it, it really has made a difference. But that's a really good use for, for that fall biennial. Now, in the winter of 2006, I went, I was speaking at a conference in Brandon, Manitoba, and I had a guy come up to me right after I was done talking, and he said, you gotta see what I'm doing. And it was Neil Dent. And I'll never forget, we sat up till three in the morning looking at photos on each other's computer, and I thought I was doing the right thing, high stock density, but I wasn't near as high as me. And, and I was moving them once a day, and Neil was moving multiple moves for it. Well, Neil invited me up there the spring of 07, and I went and I looked at a million pounds of beef live weight on an acre. And then I looked at the soil, and I saw what was happening. You know, he's putting real small paddocks, moving them multiple moves per day, he uses bat latches, those are little solar power gate openers. Uh, that's a bungee cord there. You just punch the time in the day you want that little dial to turn, opens up. So he only has to go out there once a day, roll up the fences, set the new ones. Well, after looking at his soils, I saw that there was no doubt he was building more carbon quicker than I was on my rangeland. And I understood it for rangeland, but on the way home, I got thinking about it, and it dawned on me that was the missing link, one of the missing links, in my cropland. Because look at how our prairie soils were formed. Large herds, vines and elk, we talked about this, moving across. If I want to bring my cropland up to where, you know, it used to be, and, and regenerate it, I need to integrate livestock on it. So now, that's what we've started to do, is to integrate high stock density grazing on the cropland. So, this photo here, that's winter triticale berry bench. Now, obviously, for maximum gain on the livestock, you're not going to let it get that mature. But that's not our resource concern on this particular piece of ground. Our resource concern here was that we didn't have enough carbon on the soil surface. So we purposely let that fall biannual get to a higher carbon state because we want that ornament. 
then we'll go in there with high stock density. Now, that there is 700 and some thousand pounds per acre, live weight per acre on it. Doesn't look like it in there. We're doing multiple moves per day. There the bat laps just opened up. That group of heifers is, is uh, moving. Now, we typically, this is what I call landscape. You know, we're trying to affect the resource. We're not going to use our grass finishers to landscape. So we like to use our open heifers, because this is before breeding season. They'll, they'll still put on weight, so it'll be fine. This is what it looks like after they've been through. You can tell where the fence was. I mean, they mat down that carbon on the soil surface, and that soil armor. That's what we want to see. That soil is covered. You know, there is virtually zero percent bare ground in it. And RCS would be happy with you after that. The other thing is, look at the dung and urine all spread out. You don't even notice that there was that much, that many animals on there. And the dung beetle activity has just jumped up, etc. So here's what we did. We had 368 head on there. We charged a dollar twenty a day. So there's our gross income. The land cost was figured in half. Is I'll show you. I'm going to get another crop off that field. So we can net a pretty good amount. But then look at the value. What's the value of enhanced soil? That's what we don't know. We're resting and recovering our our pastures, our perennial pastures. So there's there's a definite positive gain there. Plus we're having a real impact on that crop plant. So, then we'll go in, and that photo there, look how dried up that is, is only three days after that. We're in there, and we need to be, we need to be in there immediately. I really thought John had a good point yesterday. We need to get in immediately. We just work pretty slow. Spend too much time on the phone talking to Ray, I guess. But <laughs> we'll go directly in there. There's no herbicide use here or anything. That will terminate. That high stock density will terminate that fall by anything. Then we'll go in there with a very diverse mix, predominantly warm season, because we're doing this, that was late June, early July, when we were grazing that fall by end. So we'll go in there with a the mix, and there are some cool seasons in this mix, in case our summer turns cool, but it's predominantly warm season. Sorghum, sedan grass, millet, sunflowers, uh, uh, soybeans, cow peas, buckwheat, those warm season species make up the largest percentage of the mix. That's what the seed looks like, very diverse seed mix. I always joke to people that out east when I show this picture, they get hungry, you know, they kind of <laughs> like eating that along the coast. Here's what it looks like, because I always get asked the question, how do you set your drill, how does a small seed come up? You just put it middle notch, go in there and seed. The large seed, it breaks away from the small seed. We gotta make sure it's covered. I like that half, three quarter of an inch deep. But that larger seed will break away for the smaller seed, and then that smaller seed will be able to emerge also. Look at the soil structure for that disc wrap. Look at the aggregation. That's what we want to see. Works really well. The other thing, as I talked about yesterday, with that type of armor, we're able to keep those soil temperatures cooler, less evaporation, cooler temperature, we're going to have more biological activity too. Earthworms right at the soil surface. And we're maximizing solar energy collection, just like John talked about. We want to collect as much sunlight as we can. With all those different leaf sizes and shapes, we're going to do that. I also add species in that mix for a specific purpose for the livestock. Plantain is, has some qualities that are natural internal parasite control. We'll put a little plantain in that mix. And it's amazing to us because we haven't used any dewormers or anthelmintics for many years on our cowboy. But when we move cattle into here, at times you'll notice they'll select for the, like the plantain. And they're deworming themselves. That's what they're doing. If we would have a very diverse native system, you'll notice cattle will select certain species at certain times. They can, they can actually tell when they need a certain mineral, etc. So you can use this to these diverse polyculture mixes to your advantage and use them for things like that. In other words, we're feeding the whole, as I talked about yesterday. We're feeding the above ground, our livestock, we're feeding the below ground, the worms, and all the biology in the soil. With very diverse mixes like this, you're going to really jumpstart that soil health. So, then we have this
finish the verse next, come later towards late summer, there's several options we can do with that, too. One thing we can do is we can grass finish cattle. And we like to grass finish a lot of cattle on these warm season mixes. Now, we do not run near as high a stock density when we're grass finishing because we want them to be able to select for maximum gain. So we can easily get gains well in excess of two and a quarter pounds. We've done over three pounds a day gain on, on some groups in this mix, depending on the stage of maturity of the, uh, of the uh, warm season mix and the cattle that we're, we're finishing. But it works extremely well for us. Or, instead of doing that, you can let it go and not graze it with grass finishers or stockers and just let it go and mature. This photo here was taken just before a killing frost, so it was taken the first week in September. A week later, it had froze several nights. Notice the warm seasons, the sorghum, sedan, soybeans, etc., are froze, but you have all these brassicas and other species that are still green. This Winfred kale, there's, there's species that we can easily keep green and growing most years up until Thanksgiving. So we're able to extend that period of time that we have a living root in the soil. Works really well. Once we get past, uh, once it freezes several times, then the cattle will go to seeking out this kale first, rather than the sorghum sedan Because they're going to select for energy first. They, they know where, where the best nutrients are. And how we convert that cover crops to dollars is through grazing. And we like to run our cow-calf pairs on these winter covers. We'll use a poly wire and pigtail posts in most situations. Matter of fact, last week, I was still able to push pigtail posts into our soil, even though we've been to, you know, we've been 20 below for at least 30 nights this winter already. But we can still do it because we have that porosity, that, that aggregate structure in the soil. Now, if we have a lot of deer pressure, and there are times when we get a lot of deer pressure, then we'll go with the aircraft cable rather than poly wire. Uh, those winters I talked about when we had 120 plus inches of snow, that quarter of cropland on my home section, uh, the game and fish department flew over and they sent me the photos, 876 deer on that one quarter. The deer traveled over 50 miles, they had some of them color to find those cover crops. How they communicate, I don't know, but that, that cost me some money. So, On the other hand, you can use that to your advantage, and it could become an income stream, and I'll talk about that later on also. But heavy deer pressure will go to cable. Our local deer, because we have about a hundred head approximately on the ranch at all times, they will, they're used to poly wire, and they won't bother it, but it's when you get those, those immigrants coming in that, that's the problem. <laughs> During the winter, we typically move cattle about twice a week when we're grazing these covers. It, it'll vary and depend. That shows uh, there's 350 cow-calf pairs out there. They're grazing, and we'll move them about twice a week across this cover crop field. They'll select. They'll select for energy the first day, and then, you know, each day it gets a little less the nutrient quality that they're getting. But that's the beauty of a rumen, you know. They can have a good protein, then go through a few days of poor protein, and it's fine. Their rumen will be able to, to balance that up. Now, North Dakota State University did some good studies. They tested these, these uh, cover crop species prior to a killing frost and tested them again in late November, early December, which up our way, that, that's winter. And here's what they found. Radish is about 14, and this is the winter numbers I have up here. Radish, 14% crude protein, 70% TDM. Now I tell you, if, if you're putting brassicas in for forage, go with the terms. You know, if you're putting brassicas in to address soil health, go with the radish. Be protected. So you got to determine which which fits your, your needs there. Hairy vetch, I just really like hairy vetch. 18% crude protein still late November, early December. That'll balance any needs. Now you understand why I plant hairy vetch with my corn? They gave all these cows here grazing corn stalks in this area. If that corn stalks had vetch growing in with it, you wouldn't have to worry about supplementing any protein. It'd be supplement. Works really well, and they, and they readily eat it. Never had an animal bloat on hairy vetch. Now, to, to my knowledge, it doesn't happen. You read a few things in, in uh, 
magazine saying that the seed is toxic, I have yet to kill it. And the only research I found once was there was two horses in Brazil that time. So that's fine. North American horses are a little tough. <laughs> millet is one thing that if I'm going to graze this cover during the winter, I don't put a whole lot of millet in there because millet loses nutritional quality rapidly much, much quicker than a brown midrib sorghum sedan. And we're typically using brown midrib sorghum sedans in our mixes. It'll hold the protein longer, and it'll be much higher in energy uh, during that winter feeding period. You gotta allow your livestock to do what they do best. We do not provide a bed and breakfast for our livestock. Make them learn it. They got four legs, make them use it, you know? My wife says I should be out there grazing. <laughs> That photo there, that's not a herd of muskox. That's 350 cow calf pairs, 46 below, zero inches. Humane society may not like it, but I haven't had one of those cattle complain yet. You know? They do just fine. They tend to adapt. Now, in saying that, those cattle, if they want, it's only a mile back to shelter. They can walk back if they want, but if they want to eat, they're going to have to walk back up. So they do, and they adapt. You have to learn the best thing you can do when you start this is go on vacation. And just don't let the cows learn to be cows. And I will tell you, you know, we, we were in a registered business 26 years selling seed stock. When we switched to this type of production model, we had a large, large fall. And I'll talk about that. The cow herd in this country today is not conducive to this type of matter. Here's the economic sense from grazing those covers. We got 114 grazing days per acre. We want to leave a lot of residue. There is the economics. We, we netted $120 from the winter grazing, but then remember we had netted $350 from grazing our fall biannuals, so that's about a $477 per acre net. I can live with that, you know? That, that's pretty decent. We, we don't mind that. Now, we could and have many, many times gotten a lot higher production off of uh, those winter grazed foragers. But this is what we got the year we put this together, so that's what I'll run. So you see all the different options for a fall seeded biome? You're only limited by your imagination, you know, and that's why I like, like I said, two to four hundred acres a year, because I can go with the flow. Whatever happens, we can roll with it. It's our insurance policy, more or less. Now, another thing we can do is go in with the cool season mix. I call this the cool season primer. Early in the year, say we didn't get all of our fall biennials in and we think we need some early spring grazing, we'll go in very early, as soon as we can get in there, with a, now there's a lot more species than this in the mix, but these are the main ones. A, a forage oak, forage pea, brassica, which is usually some type of hybrid grazing brassica, and then clover. We'll go in there, very good gains. And when I'm talking to gains on this, I'm talking on stock cattle, okay? High bricks content. That's, that's what was in that particular mix. That's spring triticale, not winter triticale. In there. Sugar beets, notice they're on here. I found the sugar beets really don't like competition. So you need to put them in mixes that are not as diverse. But they are high in energy and cattle really relish them. So we'll go in there and then we'll mob graze those also. Now realize we're only doing this grazing on about 10 to 20 percent of our crop line. Okay, we still got all the rest as cash crops. But this is how we integrate it in and then we change up, rotate around the farm each year. And as I discussed yesterday, that grazing then stimulates that plant to send off root exudate, slough roots. We, we were damaged, we got to regrow, as you saw with the scum test up here. Sloughing off all those nutrients then attracts that biology. The plant starts to regrow. You improve soil health. Take a moment here to show you that you know you might think that all we do is move cattle. No, every every summer my son and I go fishing in Canada for a week. Those cattle they don't get moved. You know we'll set a, a one or two moves up for the whole week, and my wife will open the gate. But that's it. You know it's quality of life on our operation also. So I wanted to throw that picture in there uh, just to make sure I made the point. So after we graze that 4-HP oak mix, that's the residue that's left. Okay? Then we go in there again. Continue regeneration. Now, obviously, if you were just in a grazing, total grazing, 
program, don't go seeing all these annuals. You're way better off with perennials. It's going to lower your cost of production. But to integrate this livestock onto our cropping system, I feel this is what's worked best in our operation. And there's many things we can do that. You know, I mentioned before the full season, warm season mix. We can go with other mixes, such as this one, the cowpea, cowpea grosso millet, buckwheat, if I have a short window of time, because that will be ready to graze within 40 days. We can go with cowpea sedan grass, something real simple, a legume and a grass. We can go here, here's a diverse mix. I seed it after I had a combine spring wheat. Very diverse mix, just for that short window of time in the fall. There's another warm season mix. About eight, nine different species on there. Works really well if it's right during the warm season of the year. So you tailor make these mixes according to your resource concerns, according to when you need it in your forage site. That's how you adapt this into a cash crop system. Any questions up till this point? I can take one or two before we get into the next segment. Yes? How do you get rid of the grass skins on that? When you put them in the early spring, how do you keep them full? How about it? I get rid of the grass skins when I put them in the early spring deal. And that's a good question. I no longer see radish early in the spring because it'll generally bolt. The turnips aren't going to bolt. So we normally don't put radishes in early in the spring. Up in our environment, we need to wait until around that 4th of July period. You know, uh, once it turns summer, then we can put, add radishes to the mix. That's, that's a good question. Yep. As far as terminating them, I don't worry if they come back because it's just going to be another cover crop. Another question. Can you explain why mob grazing rather than just letting them go across the whole field? Yeah. Because they have to grow across the field. Why mob grazing rather than letting them grow across the whole field? You would have to ask God how, how this whole thing evolved, like why it evolved like that. But think of what's happening. You're concentrating a tremendous amount of animal impact, dung, urine, hair, milk foam, all these other things right on the soil at that time. You're laying down a tremendous amount of carbon on the surface to feed the macroorganisms. Then all that dung, urine, everything is helping to recycle that through. It's kind of like if you went out and you just fertilized one strip at a time, you know, that's more or less what you're doing. If they're spread out over a big area, you don't get the animal impact. You know, I've never seen, and this is what was hard to wrap my mind around that first time I went up to Neil Dennis's, because I was moving them once a day. He was moving them multiple moves per day. What's the difference? It's the concentration. It's the hoof impact. You're just concentrating things much more. You don't get that even uniform uh, map of, of uh, biomass laid down if you let them go pick. You know, also, if you're doing it multiple days, you got a problem with it, start to regrow and then take the second bite, et cetera. Yes? How are you seeding your hairy vetch with the corn? How am I seeding the hairy vetch with the corn? Okay, when I used to use glyphosate, back in the old days, before I was <laughs> I would go in in the fall of the year and I'd see winter triticale, hairy vetch together. Spring of the year, I'd hit it with a light application of glyphosate. If you kill the winter triticale, make the hairy vetch sick, I'd plant my corn into that. The corn would come up and grow, then the hairy vetch would come. Today, because I no longer use glyphosate, I go in and I seed it the day before I plant my corn. Now what I've done, I bought a white planter with 15 row inch inner plants. And so I'm going to put my corn on 30s and then a cover crop on 30s in between the corn. Because I don't want the two passes and I don't like, you know, for one, I'm burning diesel, time, labor, etc. But also I don't like chopping up all that residue with two passes. So that, that's how we're doing it now. Okay, now I'm going to move on to what we call our nature-driven crop extent. Question for you, why do we limit our income opportunities? So many operations as I travel around the country, they're only cow-calf, they're only stockers, they're only sheep, they're only corn bean, they're only wheat, whatever the case may be. Then you're only making money when that commodity is at the highest price. Or if you're a least cost producer, you can make money every year, but it really is tight many years. It's a typical scenario, a little hard to see, but you start with soil, your grain or livestock producer or both, that's about your potential for income there. You can be corn, you sell it to the ethanol plants, or XB 
feed for livestock, or you go to the commodity market. That's the scenario I found myself in. I was really limited in what I could do in the income stream. In other words, I was a price taker instead of a price maker. I made the comment up in Gary, and I'll never forget the time I hauled oats to the elevator and they offered me 99 cents. I knew right then and then, some suckers would not give me that extra penny to call it a dollar. And I knew that I was in the wrong production line. I needed to set my own price, because I begged for that penny and he wouldn't give it. And I thought, I'm done with this, I'm changing. So, we had a real paradigm shift. For years, that was our customer. We hauled to the grain out. That's just what you do. Whatever they're offering, you know, we can do some things, obviously, with hedging, etc. But it's really not being a price maker. And we sold livestock conventionally through the sale line. You know how that goes. You got to have a couple people there to bid. So be it. Today, our mindset has changed. We're one where we want to be conservative when it comes to deploying capital and spending resources, but be innovative when it comes to learning. Practicing ideas to achieve land regeneration and to ensure sustainability for future generations. That's the mindset we're in now. So it's totally different than the mindset of being a price taker. Young man on the left here, I claim him as my son. My wife says it was a cold man. But he's 6'4", so a little bit of difference there. My wife's shorter than I am, so I don't know. I'll, I'll, I, I like my theory that is my son. But <laughs> one of the things we do, we also have an older daughter that, that our daughter didn't, you know, she's often married and she didn't want to be active in the farm, although that will change, that is changing here, as I'll explain to you. We knew that our son was going to come take over the operation. So before he got out of college, we sat down with him and his sister and we developed a plan. We set up what's called a family limited liability limited partnership. That's a lot of fancy jargon that only the lawyers know, but in, in essence, it ensures that nursing homes, et cetera, can't come and take the rent. So my wife and I own that, and we set up a transition plan that every year, Paul is on the operation, we transition 5% of it to him. So at the end of 20 years, the ranch is in that, it's still in the FLLP, but he'll have all the stock of it down the road. And we're retired, okay? It's a simple, easy transition plan. If our daughter would have wanted to be a part, we could transition part of it to her. Plain and simple, you know? And then we have some other caveats in there, can't be sold outside the family, etc. But that's set up in the FLLP. Very simple. Also separates, you know, Paul's got his own money, we got our own money, the FLLP runs the business. Allows us a lot of flexibility for tax purposes also. I made the challenge to Paul before he come back. I said, the ranch will be yours if you show the ambition, work hard enough, but you have to bring something to the operation. So uh, I offered him this. I said, I'll tell you what, any new enterprise you start, you can have 100% of the in net income from that enterprise. But you're not going to come and just live off mom and dad's check. -in. That isn't going to happen. So. We decided we wanted to direct market. We've been really focused on soil health, taking this soil health to human health. So we set up a limited liability company that we call Browns Marketing LLC. Now the ranch, the FLLP, sells the animals to the LLC, then the LLC processes and direct markets. Also, if we have any problems, somebody doesn't cook some poultry or whatever enough, they, you know, legally, the LLC is what they can come at, because we're not tied to that, okay? We set that up purposely so Paul is the majority owner, because I want to teach him how to manage and run a business. So he's 60% owner, my wife and I each 20. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears just for a moment, because I needed a place to get this part into the story. But I needed to show you how we were set up, because you'll see coming up when we get into income and expense and profit centers, how it, all, uh, how it all shakes up. Now, for years, uh, one year, we, Jay and I were sitting around and, and we were trying to figure out, because in North Dakota, it's the third largest potato growing state, I believe, and I had a group of potato growers coming to her, yeah, but you can't grow no-till potatoes. So we pondered on that a while, and what this is, I, I spread a little bit of compost out there, and you'll see we just laid the potato seed right on top. 
Then we fire up the tractor, roll the bale of hay over it, and that's our potatoes growing in a strip there. It grows up through, we like to use second cutting alfalfa. You can't get it real thick, or the potatoes will have a hard time growing, coming through. Then in the fall of the year, you roll the hay back, there's your potato. You can do no-till potatoes, see? Moral of the story is don't challenge us. We'll figure out, you know? <laughs> now, along with that, what we have around there, that's right after we harvested the potatoes, that 30 acres there is one of our gardens. And I'll show you how we do that. There's David Brandt in Ohio, Gail Kohler in Kansas, and myself. We got a little bet going on to see who can do the craziest thing each year. Well, I had dawned on me one winter. I knew I'd get it. I thought, what really is a garden? You know, it ticks me off. We have this no-till garden behind the house and these nice neat rows, and I don't like it because it's not nature. Nature doesn't seed things in neat rows. So I took, I took 30 species of garden vegetables. I took 20 species of annual flowers, 20 species of cover crops, put them in the drill, plugged every other row, and seeded 38. And that's what it looked like. It was absolutely beautiful. Wife asked, what do you want for supper? Whatever I tripped over, that's what we were eating. <laughs> but we had flowering species in there, you know, to attract the pollinators. There's all kinds of flowers in there, all kinds of vegetables. Now, I did not do this with things in our environment that we don't have a long enough growing season for, uh, such as tomatoes, green peppers, those we still transplanted in our permanent garden. But pumpkin, squash, zucchini, everything else you can imagine went in that garden. Carrots, radishes, you know, cantaloupe, you name it, it was there. Then my, my son kept track, and, and off of those acres, we harvested over 20,000 pounds of zucchini and squash. Yeah, the people at church did leave their windows up on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to get some. Now what we did with it, we just used what we wanted ourselves and then we donated the rest to food pantries and we allowed needy families to come and pick and that, that meant a lot to us. It, it helped out some people. But the moral of the story is think of what happened on those, that field when we do that. Instead of growing a monoculture, it taken my whole lifetime to do that. I did it in one year. I primed that soil. I fed it. Now I will say this much. We're in a dry environment. Last year we were really dry all summer. You know, 38 one hundredths of an inch all summer, it didn't work very good the garden. But so be it. You know, I'll have some garden seeds in time. They still grew, and then we grazed it. So we got, you know, back most of our seed income. We try and grow almost everything we eat on our place. And, you know, this just shows one day our daughter comes from uh, Fargo, drives over, and we spend the whole day as a family canning. Works out real well. It's, it's a good family activity. What else are we going to do? That's in the evening, right? That's at night we do those things, okay? <laughs> now I'm going to talk a little bit about our grass finished beef. As I said, I was a conventional producer for years. And I realized over time that the, the livestock I was offering to my customers were not the kind that really made money in a forage type system. I own this newspaper from 1888. That, that's on the cover of it. Man, I wish I could find genetics like that today. There's an 1882 newspaper with an Aberdeen cow on it. You look at what happened. This is the livestock we see today. Took this photo. Here's another one. You know, that one was just in the, in the paper not too long ago. Are these last two animals, are they conducive to converting porridge to red meat? Not at all. Here's the genetics that we're trying to propagate on our operation. We need genetics that will convert forage in our environment. And our environment's going to be different than your environment. Only you can find out. I tell people I want cows that look just like me. Short, thick, easy fun. <laughs> That's what I want. And they got to have a big middle. And if they don't have a big middle, they can't win around a rock. You know, and I tell people that's what I want. We expect our cows to perform on our forage. Then why as an industry do we breed everything to perform in the feedlot? You know? And they're converting grain. I'll tell you this much. We've harvested a lot of cattle. I have yet to find a gizzard in there. That and pound. Then why, then why are we breeding our cattle to convert starch? Doesn't make sense. So it's been a real learning curve for us. And like I said, we had a huge fallout when we made the conversion. But now it's working well. We still have a ways to go. 
Cow size matters. When your grass finishes, steers are going to finish approximately 100 pounds heavier than the dam, heifers approximately 100 pounds lighter. I can pick up any local ag periodical in our, in our state, the average cow weights easily over 1,500 pounds, easily in North Dakota. That means I got to try and grass finish 1,600 pound steers. It isn't going to work. 1,400 pound effort isn't going to work. So, what I got here, this is our cost to produce a grass finished heifer at 1,200 pounds this past year. And I break it out because we leave, we leave the, the, the cows on, the calves on the cow for almost 300 days, and then their fence line lean, there's only a short period of time when those calves then are bale grazing, then they go out on that grazing NAT, is native forage, they're grazing native forage. Then they go to grazing cover crops, then that short period of time down here where they're, they're bale grazing, those 90 days, we have to feed high quality forage, that's why we're taking the bricks measurements, because right there, those calves, they're, they're coming two-year-olds, and we got to keep them gaining weight. And then the finishing period is out on that smooth grown legume mix, you know, the tame grass legume mix, or those covers, winter tree daily, the fall biennials, or the warm season covers. So this past year, we produced uh, a 1,200 pound animal at a little over 735 days of age for $1,022. Now the cost, why it's so high up here, the nursing period, that includes any uh, charge on open cows also. So we got that, that figured in there also. So when we go to retail that out, and I'll explain our retail business in a minute, that's what we, our gross income average per animal that we retailed out. And there was heifers in there, there was steers in there, and there was some tall cows in there that we marketed to ground beef. So $3,452. The $707 includes everything, hauling the animal to the facility, the processing charge, bringing the animal back, our time and labor to do that, and our time and labor to market it. That's all in there. The live animal cost of $2,000, that's what the ranch charged the LLC for the animal. Now, I realize we could have sold them on the open market higher, but the beauty of this, this two-tiered system is we're able to juggle things for tax purposes. Okay? I'll say it plain and simple. And IRS, if you're watching, hello. That's fine. You know? It's all about ground relief. Okay? So our net profit, this is for the LLC, was $645. Okay? That's just for the marketing portion of a beef animal. But then the ranch made $988. So the total net profit per animal harvested was about $1,633. Got it? So you can juggle this accordingly do with it what you make. So that's the beef app. On to those wonderful sheep, which I tell you, I am waiting for the day we find an intern who really wants to take over sheep operation because we need a lot more of them in our, in our program. The sheep have worked out really well, though we run hair sheep, simply because we right now just don't have time to, to monkey with the wolf. There is the U, the cost for a U, now we only realize we're really rookies at this, beginners, and we only average 1.6 lambs slaughtered per year, okay? So, and the finishing phase is the finishing of the individual lamb, each individual lamb, when we're grazing those. And typically we graze those on, on covers also. So, the retail business netted, uh, no, it cost us about $118 to finish a lot. Then the retail end, we, we sold the product $427. Our harvesting costs at the average for are pretty high on those small animals because they charge a set fee, doesn't matter the size, to kill. So that, that's costing us some money. The ranch is charging the retail business $180, so our net profit retail is $128. You add that to the $62 profit the ranch made, $190 per lamb, you know, so that comes to what, about $270 per you? That's a pretty good return. We can do better, though. We can get that lamb up and we're working on it. Okay. Now, profit sense. When I look at our operation, I, I see dollar signs and potential. We needed guard dogs to guard those sheep because we get a lot of kites. We might as well buy a male and a female, right? So, we had a lot of guard dog pups. Matter of fact, we had a lady drive from Colorado all the way up to buy two pups. I run border cows, 
simply because I enjoy it. There are those dogs that are so much smarter than I, I just like working with them, you know? It's kind of like me when I travel with Ray, I just watch him. Just at all, you know? <laughs> so, I got a male and female border collie there. Last year, we, we made $14,000 selling pups. Think about it, you know, that's health insurance for the man, right? Man, who doesn't enjoy having some pups there, you know? It, it's just another profit center. You might as well take advantage of it, right? Now, we did buy pretty decent stuff, okay? It wasn't like we were just using giveaways to breed this, but they're not paper or anything. We didn't need that. We don't pay for the pups, so we don't have expenses there. I didn't charge a cost in here of the dogs, because the dogs are the parents, because they're earning their keep out doing what we need them to do, okay? So, but it's another profit stream. Now another one we've gotten into, and every year my son comes to me with a different enterprise dad, and of course I told you, he's getting that profit, so I don't know where it'll stop, but that's okay. By the time it stops, it's probably when dad retires. We'll see. <coughs> Pasture pork. There's the Baconator he made. My son loves metal work. He loves working with metal, so he takes these, drives around, whenever he drives by a farmstead, he looks for the junk. And he pulls in, and how much do you want for that? that that's actually an old auger frame. He took, found another old hog feeder laying outside behind someone's trees. I think he bought that for $25. He pulls this around as we rotate the hogs around. There's our sow carrying cost. Everything's in there to, to carry the sow. We average slaughtering 11 piglets per sow, which is really hot. We know that. We just kind of lucked out. Finishing pays. Now, there's another mark, uh, uh, revenue stream for us. When we have our, our cash grains, we run that grain through quick clean, screen, take the screenings up. That's what these hogs are being fed. They're being fed a mixture of corn screens, pea screenings, and, and uh, a little bit of oat screen. That's what they did. We don't supplement any mineral to the sheep or hogs or that. They're out there looking around. They, they do fine. So that's our cost to finish per hog is $134. Here's what we could retail a hog for. That's a lot of money. Okay? Processing cost $259. The ranch is charging the, the LLC $275 per hog. So the, the, the uh, <coughs> LLC, this past year, netted $517 per hog. That's per hog, okay? That's quite a bit of money, you know? Now, we don't have a huge, large amount of competition yet, marketing direct in North Dakota. I suspect that'll change. That's why I do not give this presentation in North Dakota, okay? <laughs> so, you take and add the $141 the ranch made, that's $658 per hog, multiply that times 11. Why in the world would I want to run cattle? You know, really. Now, of course, we're going to be limited by the market, but we are and have expanded the hog operation. That, that's a serious profit right there. Another thing he's in is broilers. This is one of the broiler mobiles that gets pulled, moved every day out on pasture. He is only limited by the number his mom and dad will help him butcher. There is no processing plant in North or South Dakota. So we're limited to 999 birds is all we can legally process and sell off our place. We cannot sell them at farmer's market. They have to come pick them up legally, okay? There's the first broiler mobile he ever made. That's two gate frames underneath with some PVC pipe attached to it. Some old tin from a building we tore down. Pretty cheap, pretty simple. There's income per bird. And all these are getting is we, we have a custom starter ration made because we're buying them as day olds. So for the first three weeks, they're on that starter ration. Then they're strictly on screen. That's all they get fed and whatever they can get from grass, insects, etc. moving that. Now, we keep our broilers caged up. But net profit per bird is 12 dollars Pretty decent. Well, I'll talk about the slaughter facility later on. Here's the layer, the laying operation. What Paul likes to do is take those old stock trailers that people have bought giveaway and he'll retrofit them. That little door on the side there, that's a photosensitive eye above it. So in the morning, that door raises, at night it closes. Funny story, one day I was having breakfast looking out, it was just, the, the sun was just starting to come up, there was a kayak just sitting there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't 
get, he didn't get blood poisoning either. He got away before I, I could get him. We do lose a few to coyotes, but, but um, it really isn't that many. In this particular photo, you'll notice the netting there. This was some bullets. They weren't laying yet in this particular one. He has three of these egg mobiles now. Uh, so with bullets, they're not used to going in a nest. We put up netting. The layers, though, they're, they're free range. They just go wherever they want, not held in with netting. So that's the inside. He just guts the floor off, puts wire mesh in there, hangs the nest boxes on the back, roosts on the side up front. It's a 55 gallon drum attached to it as a quick coupler. So when we go to our pastures and we have the quick couplers for water, we can just stick in there, fill that, and there's gravity fed water. We really like to use these layers along with the grass finished beef cap. We'll pull this egg mobile on the opposite side of the fence wherever the water source is, because that's where manure tends to accumulate in that, and then the layers take care of all the insects. Yeah, works pretty good. Right now he's at $4 a dozen for the eggs. There's a difference. That's a store-bought egg and a, a range-free hen. Say, definitely makes a difference. So what we did here, we just figured out, because we're moving that egg mobile about every five days, because usually our cattle, it depends on where the water source is, but they'll roam over about an acre. So we figured how many eggs, right now he's running about 600 hens. We're getting about 350 eggs a day, which is not real high, but these hens are just out. Whatever they're producing for us is great, because they're doing their job uh, taking care of fly larvae, etc. There's the cost of the hen, the feed, the marketing, processing for the eggs. So he's netting about 427 an acre. Now, you need a heck of a lot of hens to get over all the acres, but that can just show you the amount of crop. He's selling them for $4 a dozen. He's going to go to five next year. And it's amazing. Farmer's market opens at 10 o'clock. 9 o'clock, he's got people lining up for eggs. Five minutes, he's sold out everywhere. And he's only taking them once a week to market because he just can't be in the supply. We'd love to find an intern that wants to take over that part of the operation. So, the question for you, why do we limit our income opportunities? As I said before, why are we only cow-calf, only cash grain? Need to become price makers instead of price takers. Now, one of the things we had to do in order to do this was address our processing gap or need. In North Dakota, there was only three facilities that were state inspected that you could get an animal harvested and then market the product. The waiting list was over a year to get anything harvested. So we had to get together and we had to build a processing facility. So a group of us did in North Dakota. It was a four-year process. It took some time, but we've been open now and it's running. We process bison, beef, lamb, and pork there. And it's working real well. We're actually showing profitability already. This is our ranch's own trademark logo. Nourished by nature, that's what we call our business. So that Browns LLC has this as a trademark. We then direct market our products, you know, directly to consumers. That's our new customer base. Rather than taking these animals to the sale barn, we're marketing them direct to customers. And I tell you what, there's no better feeling in the world than handing someone a steak, charging them $20 a pound, they pay you for it and thank you. That's a good, good feeling, you know? <laughs> I like that feeling. I, I feel I can handle that. But what we're trying to do is sell our story. We're trying to prove that we, from healthy soil comes about healthy food. And we're actually doing some testing now on our products to prove that the nutrient density of the products we're producing is higher than the standard of the industry. I'm going to show you some proof here on why this current production and model is not working. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world. Yet we're the 42nd healthiest country in the world. That's ridiculous. Are farmers and ranchers to blame for all that? Of course not. Of course not. You know? But look at this. We're first in chronic diseases, cancer, ADD, ADHD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, osteoporosis, obesity, and the list goes on. Why is that? I can't be a producer and not think that I have something to do with it. And that weighs on my conscience every day. So when I make my management decisions, and you hear Ray talking about holistic management, how important it is to have this soil healthy, nutrients flow through the soil. That's what's supplying the sustenance that we need to live. <coughs> Consumers are willing to pay for nutrient-dense food. 
And you know what? We always hear, oh, but it's easy for you. You're up there near the oil patch. 80 plus percent of our customers are mothers with young children. 80 plus percent. They want to know what's going in their children's mouth. They want the face of the person producing it. That's what they want. And they want to know, you know, the way that they're producing it. This is a really busy slide, but it's an important one. Carbon. How many times did you hear that the last few days? Carbon. It all starts there. Here's our where we go. We have cash crops. I told you about them yesterday. Cover crops. I explained them. We got all these perennials, the pastures. Here's the businesses we run. Okay, we produce some vegetables. We produce grain, pork, poultry. I haven't talked about the bee enterprise. We got sheep. We got dogs. Cow calf pairs. We can market wildlife. Those 876 deer. Do you know how many uh, deer sheds they drop? Do you know what people are willing to pay for deer sheds? Potentially in the street. I didn't talk about the, our orchard or that. I just didn't have time. But down here, everything below those dollar signs, that's all income streams for us. I can't tell you the last time I really looked at a grain market report. Doesn't matter. So grains down, look at all these others I got. You know? And that's just from our little operation, you know? You're only limited by your imagination. Paul and I sat down and worked through this, and there's so many things. Like, I didn't even talk to you about the pet food we sell, about how we sell some livestock feed. We do sell a little bit of cover crop seed, you know. We choose not to charge for hunting. We allow a uh, um, sporting chance. It's for uh, wounded warriors and uh, paraplegics. We allow them to hunt for free. But if we wanted, we could sure charge a pretty penny for hunting because we have the wildlife because we have the ecosystem that supports them. Now, those are just some of the things we want to get into. And we've actually bought dairy cattle now. we got a lady who buys all of our, our tallow, our beef fat for soap, and we're starting an agreement with her where we'll market that. If we want to get into rabbits, we do uh, put some compost together. We have a real demand for that in town. We want to further market some of our grains into flour, mustard, etc. We can do pies, pastries. We have done turkeys and ducks in the past. We're just a bit limited on labor, so we're hoping to get some interns to do that. Paul has a real demand for fabricating egg mobiles, another potential income stream. Hide sales, floral arrangements, wool products, if we choose to go down that way, uh, way uh, road with a sheep, you know, if we decide to get some wool sheep. You're only limited by your imagination. I was at a conference here this fall in Missouri, and there was about 160 people in attendance. And it wasn't me, but a speaker asked, he said, how many of you have a son, daughter, or family member coming back to the place? Me and one other person raised our hand. How come that is? That's a travesty. You can't tell me. I get calls every day. We just, we just put out a simple flyer uh, accepting applications for interns. We had over 80 applicants within a month. You know, there's young people out there just dying for the chance. Yet, we're not allowing them. I get really sick when I hear, oh, I don't want my son or daughter to ranch. There's no opportunities. Really? Really? There's no opportunities between your ears. It's a problem. You know? <laughs> Keith, what was the comment to that there down there in Texas? You can't no till till you put daddy in the ground? Yep. Yeah, you can't get these enterprises started until you put daddy in the ground either. You know? Don't let that happen on your operation. Other things we're working on. We got our beef facility up and running. Now we've done the feasibility study for the poultry facility. That'll be next. Because we know, think about the, can you imagine the planes here, how many birds there were on the planes at one time? We want to increase that part of our operation. In order to do that, we're going to have to put up a poultry facility. You know, somebody's got to do it, you know, and we're going to do it. We're also working to start a local producer co-op where if you have vegetables, if you have meat products, we can be an aggregator. This business would be an aggregator and then we'd be able to distribute it up to different grocery stores, restaurants, etc. That's being done in a lot of places. It's not being done in North Dakota. So we're working on getting that one done. We also are happy to announce by mid-summer our local food co-op will be up and running. There's 100,000 people right next to us. There's no place to buy really good local foods except at the farmer's market. So, 
We've been working on this for over four years, and we've got the lease now, and this is going to take place this summer. We're hiring a manager, so that's exciting news for us. The other thing is, uh, I, I mentioned quite a few times interns, and you know, <laughs> you want to, I don't know if they make you feel young or old, one or the other, but we've really tried hard to expand the internship opportunities on our ranch. They have to have a desire, we, we have a desire to educate and empower others to become the next generation of leaders. But how are they going to do that? It's like, I've sat on a lot of board of directors over my lifetime here. It kills me how some of these people stay on the board for 20 or 30 years. How in the world are you going to develop the next generations of leaders if you sit on the board for that many years? Just ticks me off. Because what happens is the same thing we see in Washington. You know, your life. And we don't need that. So we're trying really hard to help that next generation get started. And the way we're doing this is, I offer all of our interns, I said, you want to get started in farming? If you have the desire and the will, I'll guarantee you I can help you get started. Because what we'll do, we'll peel off one of our enterprises and we'll tell them, okay, here you go, this is your baby. But we're not hiring you, you're not an employee. You've got to make money off that enterprise, we'll buy the product from you. And I'll guarantee you the price. That way it teaches them the importance of taking care of the livestock or whatever it may be. They got to learn business and they have a business. We got a young couple who are to be joining us this year and they're so excited and I told them, and they're not from farms, but I said, don't worry, I'll give you the opportunity if you have the will and desire. They got to be willing to work though. The other thing we're really trying to do is open up our operation. That's the grass that exchange in 2013. We'll get about 2,000 visitors a year through our ranch. We've had visitors from all 50 states, 16 foreign countries. But I'll tell you, I'm really greedy because I don't mind sharing my experiences, but I really want to learn from others. And I've learned things here the past two days. You know, Gabe's really not very intelligent. I'm just really good at picking things that are working for other people and then copying them on my operation. And that's what it's about. Obviously, everything I shared with you yesterday and today isn't going to work on your operation. But I'll tell you what, I bet there's a few things that will. Use them. Whatever fits your needs, your goals, go ahead and use them. Which education model is driving us? Oh, there's another part of that that didn't show up. Ah, oh, here it comes, I think. Masanubu, Ray's favorite guy, had this in his book, Lost Trial Revolution. Modern research divides nature into tiny pieces and conducts tests that conform neither with the natural law nor with practical experience. The results are arranged for the convenience of the research, not according to the needs of the farmer. Okay, I know what Ray and I shared with you yesterday and today. A lot of that isn't proven out by research. More of it's getting there. But which model do you want to follow? You know? Which education model is going to drive you? It's up to each and every one of you. We're simply sharing our experience with you. So with that, I know I'm past break time, but I can take a couple questions if I do as well. Yes, here's one. What do you do with the laying hands in the wintertime? What do we do with the laying hands in the wintertime? This winter they're actually in a pole barn because the uh, hoop house that we ordered didn't show up till December. And I was on the road and my son wasn't going to build it himself in December, but they will be going into the hoop house. We actually ordered a portable hoop house so we're able to move it. Obviously during the winter we won't be moving it, but we'll be able to move it then, make compost where they were. We've got some plans for that. But yeah, they have to be inside during the winter in our environment. So. Um, why, why do you why nurse the calves for 300 days? Several reasons. I'm lazy, I'm lazy, I'm lazy. That's three of them. But the big reason is, think of it this way. How is that calf going to learn which of those cover crops, which of those native species to eat? How is that calf going to learn that when it feels, through barometric pressure, a storm coming, to walk a mile back to the farmstead so it's not out there in the wind? We use that as the learning, the education. That's college for our calves. In other words, and if we expect our heifers to become cows, they got to go through that, and they got to learn. That. Because what we do with our heifers is we pretty much expose all of our heifers to 30 to 35 days. Those that are bred go in the cow herd. Those that aren't fall out. They go in the cow herd or 
soul to those that are bred. But we're letting nature do the color. And that's one way. If we have calves that just can't pack it, you know, and, and the, the cow comes up open, they're gone, the calf's gone, let nature do the color. Plain and simple. Yep. Anything else? Yes. How do we water the cows? On summer cover crops, the, the, we have uh, shallow pipelines, and I'll get into that this afternoon, throughout our whole farm line, buried a foot below the soil surface. Everything's watered on it, but uh, we use permanent tire tanks there, but we're only on there for a short time. They're cheap to buy and install, so that's what we use during the summer on cover. They will have to walk back to that tire tank, but we have a lot of them on our place, and I'll show you that in summer. How about farrowing cells? They're farrowed out in the shelter belts and that. We made a mistake. We only farrowed them once this past year. They got to looking like me. They'll be farrowed twice this next year. But they're farrowed out, and we actually use, like, they're going to be farrowing here in, in mid to late April. And uh, Paul went to a friend of his who has this 40 play range, and they use those calf hutches. Well, there was a few damaged ones that somebody shot up. He got them for free, and he has them out there, and then they farrow them. Works pretty simple. Yep. Well, we better take a break here. Huh? Thank you so much, Steve.